today I thought we could do some Golang. Why not? Um, I've never had the chance to code much Go, so this should be fun. Um, so we're back on Exorcism. So let's start from the beginning. I can look for Go as a language and we are ready to join the Go track. Let's see where we go with this. And um, as we seen yesterday for Elixir, we start from a hello world. The target for today is to do five exercises, excluding hello world. So uh, let's get going. Fans of Go, called Gophers, describe Go as having the expressiveness of dynamic languages like Python or Ruby with the performance of compiled languages like C or C++. Okay, that sounds like a good start. The language is open source and was started by engineers at Google. It's written using a C style syntax, has statically typed variables, managed memory using garbage collection, and is compiled into standalone executables. And I know that this, at the time when Go came out, this was a big deal because uh, it means that you can distribute your executables without with all the dependencies encapsulated and uh, your users can just install that and run it without having to worry about um, libraries and, uh, and other dependencies. Go is noted for the concurrent programming features built into the language core, the networking packages in the standard library, fast compilation and execution speed. Okay, and about concurrency, very well i'd say i'm familiar with with golang's concurrency because um oh thanks napcat thank you for uh chiming in <laughs> um yeah so i'm familiar with the concurrency model for go because it's very similar to crystal's one and that's the one i studied first when i wanted to get a bit more familiar with the way are done uh, the way concurrency is done in in, in crystal so uh, it's a good starting point if you want to learn more about channels um, and um, sending messages through uh, channels between routines or uh, uh, fibers depending on which language you're using uh, that's a great idea and about the networking packages I could see that Go makes it very easy to do low-level networking uh, communication network communication between servers when looking at the implementation of a torrent client um, because yeah deserializing and serializing um, stuff is looks very very easy um, so that's that's true and for the fast compilation my experience with that is with the Hugo blogging engine which is a blog engine written in Go if I do Hugo blog let's see where we go the world's fastest framework for building websites um, and part of the, well, I guess the secret sauce for Hugo to be building static websites so quickly is actually the fact that it runs on Go. So good to know all these things I've uh, experienced in my life one way or the other. That's, that's all nice. It says it's simple, minimalistic and consistent language design make for a delightful experience while the abundant and thoughtful tooling addresses traditional problems such as consistent formatting and documentation. This was also one of the selling points for Go, as far as I remember, the fact that engineers don't have to spend a lot of time arguing about what's the best uh, indentation style or, or formatting style because it, it all comes packaged into the, the main um, Go tool, uh, command line tool. And then we have some information about the home page. Um, that's fine. I, and I think we can get going with exercises. Uh, and of course, for a start, uh, the only one we can take on is the hello world. Um, I don't expect there to be any surprise here. Um, yeah, just a few things we can uh, pick up. Looking at the first example, there's a package declaration at the very top. Uh, which defines the current package, I guess. And then we define a function with the, with the keyword func. Uh, also notice how we are declaring the type returned by the, by the function, uh, which is interesting. And also notice that it's lowercase rather than 
uh, uppercase as you're probably used to uh, see. The other weird thing is in Go, functions are capitalized. Again, not something I'm used to, so that will take a bit of uh, practice to remember. So let's go for hello world and run our tests and then move on. Okay, submitting, marking as complete, not sharing the hello world and moving on to concepts. Okay, let's start from the basics. Packages, ah, we noticed that, right? At the very top of the file. Go applications are organized in packages. Okay, a collection of source files located in the same directory. Easy enough. Um, all sources uh, or source file in a directory must share the same package name. Okay, it is conventionally conventional for the package name to be the last directory in the import path. Okay. Mm, so whatever is the folder wrapping the files, that's by convention the name of the package. Okay. When a package is imported, only entities whose name starts with a capital letter can be used. And accessed. Oh, that's interesting. So that capitalization is not random. The fact that functions are capitalized means that they can be exported when we import the package uh, and, and use when, when someone imports the package. So good to know. The recommended style of naming in Go is that identifiers will be named using camel case except for those meant to be accessible across packages, which should be Pascal case. Okay. Uh, for what concerns variables, Go is statically typed, um, which means all variables must have a defined type as compile time. Okay, meaning we'll have to be explicit and we can be implicit when using literals. Okay, uh, this is also something that might look a bit different than in other languages. We're using colon equal for assignment. And then once declare, uh, variables can be assigned values using the equal operator. Once declared, the variables type can never change. Okay, so initial value colon equal, and then every uh, following assignment just the equal sign. Fair enough. Constant can be declared with the const keyword. Okay, that's easy. And then functions we can do functions with zero more parameters, and we have to be explicit. Uh, about the return keyword, which are gonna, we're going to forget a few times during this streaming um, effort, I'm sure. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Uh, and I remember that the lasagna exercises a lot about constants. So, um, yeah, so the idea here is we want to define a few functions that help us figuring out how much time uh, our lasagna should stay in the oven if you're not familiar with the lasagna um, it looks more or less like this and it's usually structured in layers so the more layers the more time it will take to prepare it so with that in mind uh, we can go on and define how much time in the oven the lasagna should spend and in our case it should be uh, 40 minutes I think as far as I remember yep 40 minutes, I'm using colon equal for the first declaration and const to define a constant. Okay, and then when it comes to defining the remaining oven time, this is taking an integer and returning an integer. And what we're doing here is we're probably just returning oven time minus actual time minus in oven, and we must remember to return. And I'm trying to run the, to run the test now. Uh, expecting equal. Okay, why is that? Is it that for constants? Um, oh, because their value cannot change. Uh, there's no difference between the first assignment and, and next and, and following assignments. So just the equal sign will do. Fine. Okay, we can move on. A few tests are passing. Uh, next, calculate the remaining uh, oven time in minutes we've done. Calculate the preparation time in minutes. Uh, this goes back to layers. And the idea is, uh, depending on the number of layers, we'll multiply that 
by two minutes, which is the time needed to prepare a layer. So we'll define another constant, layer time, and give it a value of two, and then return layer time times the number of layers. Okay, that should just work. And finally, last task, calculate the elapsed working time in minutes. This is about the time we've spent preparing or waiting for the lasagna, so it depends on the number of layers. And on the actual minutes, the lasagna spent in the oven, so we're gonna be returning uh, preparation time for number of layers plus the actual times, actual minutes in the in the oven. Let me copy this. Always remember the return uh, at the beginning of the statement, and then we're good. We can move on. I'm marking as complete publishing so that I can share this later. Now that we've gone through the very basic uh, exercise, we have many options actually. Comments, doesn't sound too exci exciting, does it? So we'll go for maybe numbers and then strings. Yeah, let's start with numbers. Cars assemble, okay. Go contains basic number types that can represent sets of either integer or floating point values. In that sense, I guess it's very similar to what we had uh, in Elixir in the last stream. Uh, this concept will uh, concentrate on two number types, int and float64, okay. Uh, Go supports the standard set of arithmetic operations, plus minus uh, times division and uh, um, modulo. Uh, which is, yeah, <laughs> remainder, not modulo. Okay, fine. Uh, Ingo assignment of a value between different types requires explicit conversion. This is good. For example, to convert an int into a float 64, you need to do the following. Okay, we're just um, applying this uh, conversion explicitly to the to the int uh, value. So that should be easy enough. Printf looks as confusing as usual. Um, hopefully we won't have to print much in this exercise and this oh interesting to see this is just something we can pick up there's this um, reflect package uh, that gives us uh, um, functions and, and utilities to do uh, language reflection and uh, look at the inner uh, working bits of the of the language that's that's um, good to know maybe premature for this um, learning session. Okay, so let's see what we're tasked to do. Mm, calculate the number of working cars produced per hour. So we're looking at some sort of factory. Uh, the cars are produced on an assembly line with a certain speed. The faster the assembly line speed is, the more cars are produced. Okay, changing the speed of assembly line also changes the number of cars that are produced successfully. So the success rate will go down. That is, cars without any errors in their production, okay? Implement a function that takes in the number of cars produced per hour and the success rate and calculates the number of successful cars made per hour. Oh, that's great. Good fun. Mm, so we're getting the production rate and success rate. We want to return the um, number of cars per hour that are uh, produced with success. And I guess we want to do something like um, multiply the production rate. This is the number of cars produced in an hour. Multiply that by the success rate. The success rate is given as an integer, so we'll have to divide by 100, I guess. And from what we heard, from what we read a few minutes ago, we need to be explicit about converting the production rate to a float 64. Let's see what comes out of it. Okay, we passed five tests, so 
This is nice. Oh, um, I also like to spend a tiny bit of time looking at how the tests are written. So as far as I can remember, tests are usually put in the same folder as the source code they are testing. So if you're testing a specific package, you'll find a files for testing that package within the same folder. And they usually start with the, uh, they're prepended with test and then the name of the specific thing that you're testing. So it's not uh, like what we, what you, what you might be familiar with coming from Ruby or Elixir where you have a string defining what the test is about. Here the class, the, the function name of the test is actually um, telling us what we are testing. Uh, this is also interesting because you will see this testing uh, context being passed into all the tests and um, it also shows us how structs are defined in, in Go just uh, while we're at it. And so as you can see we define the struct um, types this way so we define field name and type of the field and then we can initialize one straight away on the spot very, very quickly with name, production rate and success rate and want. Want is probably the expected value. And so this is testing a few edge cases. So good to uh, review what testing style we have uh, in this um, exorcism exercise. Um, and it, as you can see, the output is fairly clear. And we also get uh, an estimate of how much time was spent running the test, which is useful. Um, so this is the thing we're expecting to produce out of the test. This is what we actually got when we calculated the working cars per hour. Okay, looking good. So moving on, calculate the number of working cars produced per minute. Uh, implement a function that takes in the number of cars produced per hour and the success rate and calculates how many cars are successfully produced each minute but we want that number in as an integer okay so um, main idea here is to take the production rate which refers to an hour and divide it by 60 but first we need to apply the success rate, success rate discount and we can probably just reuse the function we just defined, so calculate working at working car per hour with a production rate given as a parameter and a success rate, and then we want to convert this number into an integer after we've divided by the number of minutes. I wonder if we can just use this the literal 60 or if it's going to complain that 60 is a literal for an integer and we have to be explicit and just say 60.0 so let's try this out calculate cost yeah i think i think the tests are passing so go is happy with 60 being a, an integer and knows what to do uh, in converting that into um, float before division uh, and also if we can go down and look at working cars per minute yeah you can see uh, again testing extreme cases which is always uh, sorry edge cases which is al always a good idea so, so given a certain production rate and a success rate of zero we expect to find that we have zero cars per minute and that's actually what happens here something a bit more interesting for our function test is when we have a defined success rate which is more than zero and then we want a certain number of cars per minute so that that looks fine again if you can it takes a bit of getting used to to browse through Gola, golang code and, and feel uh, at home but i think um even if you've never seen this before there's not many ways this can go right when you start reading through this um interpreting this is um there's only one way to interpret this um, hard to get confused, I guess, or at least I find that to be the case. Um, final function we need to, to um, implement is calculate the cost of production. So calculate cost, considering that normally a car cost, 
cost ten thousand dollars with a bit of planning ten cars can be produced for a bit less than ten thousand dollars per car um, uh, okay so the idea is to try and figure out how many groups of 10 cars we can build with a discount and then add the remainder of that on top um, and the return value should be a, an unsigned integer okay good to know uh, so we have a cars count that is given as an argument if you remember from the previous uh, screen we can determine the remainder of the division uh, by 10 so this is going to tell us how many not cars with no discount we have let me say var from cars i should start with lowercase lowercase yeah and now that we have the remainder we also we can also compute the what do you want to call it groups car groups which is cars count divided by 10 you can also look up golang integer division if it's a thing um, funny to end up on digital ocean to look up integer division in go um, let's see quotient okay that should just be the regular division then so we'll just try and go for that so car groups are going to be cars divided by 10 so these are the discounted discounted one which are going to be built for $95,000 rather than 10,000 we can also see if we can define a few constants, right? Const uh, car cost equals 10,000. Then const um, cars car group cost equals 95,000. Okay. And then we can maybe reuse this uh, constants uh, down here. And we just need to return the total cost. So I think it's just a matter of saying remaining cars times car cost plus car groups times car group something like this let's see how far we are then we'll need to convert into unsigned integer uh, expected equal okay I think we need to I think I need to uh, understand this a bit better why uh, we need to use regular equal rather than colon equal and it might be that we go for colon equal when looking at let's try this again um, for example when defining fields on a struct can I use RAM cars times this? Yeah, and, uh, I guess we need to convert to uint, otherwise the compiler is going to be upset. There we go. If I go to the tests we passed uh, and look back at the definition of a uh, struct. Okay, there's just the column here when defining a struct values and here when we do got we do column equal is it about hmm. i think the best thing we can do here is submit mark as complete and then go back to the concept okay and check it out again uh, so we were looking at numbers and before numbers we were looking at Hmm. 
assignment of a value between different types requires explicit conversions that we know that so going back to the syllabus going to basics and going to variables variables can be defined by explicitly specifying a type oh okay you can also use an initializer and the compiler will assign the variable type to match the type of the initializer okay okay so there's two syntaxes here one where we do column equal and we get implicit type assignment and the other one where we go var or nothing and just equals stuff okay yeah i guess in the use then you figure out when over time you figure out when when var should be used and when, when it shouldn't uh, maybe next exercise we can do a few experiments I think we should go into strings straight away. How do you feel about this? Okay. The string package contains many useful functions to work on strings. Okay. Uh, for example, so we'll, Im we'll import the package and then call functions from it. Sounds good. An appliance store called Tech Palace. We need to create a welcome message for it. Add some formatting to the welcome message and then reformat old, uh, old marketing messages. Okay, this is gonna be interesting. Okay, welcome message. Uh, we will start from just concatenating a few strings. The plus operator can be used, which is good. Uh, let's give this a go. Welcome message. So this is going to be something like, uh, let's see what the expectation is. Welcome messages, welcome to the Tech Palace, and then the name capitalized, so something like Welcome to the Tech Palace, then plus, and then from the package stream, string, uh, sorry, from the, from the string package, uh, something like to upper, to upper case, or whatever the name is going to be, and then the customer. Yeah, two upper should be enough. And then we need to return this value. And I wanna try and uh, assign this to a variable just to figure out. And we need to import string as a package. Uh, is it in quotes? Or just, just import string. Import strings, okay, that's what I was missing. So we're reporting packages as strings and this package name is string. Imported and not used, okay. This is because I'm calling this wrong. So it's strings.upper and now, good that the compiler informs us when we're not using a package we imported. So that's well done, go. And then I wanted to check if I extract this into a variable So if I do message equals this, this should work as a local variable, undefined message. Uh, okay, so what? I would have to go var message equal. Okay, and the other thing is I could go message equals and here go like var message string, something like this. Yeah, <laughs> now that's, yeah, I guess. 
needs a bit of getting used to. But okay, uh, okay, let's do this the other way. Uh, bar message equals, and then move on to the next exercise. We need to add some border at the top of our message. Let's look at the instructions again. Add a fancy border. Um, so we probably want to have We're returning, we're still returning some sort of message and we want to define the message as what? <laughs> From stars per lines. Okay, we just want to concatenate the number of stars. So we probably have stars equals stars x times how do we build this so in ruby you do something like 10 times star and that would give you or you know num stars per line multiplied by a string and that would just or the other way around and that would just create a string with x times the uh, the same the same character or set of characters but here this might be a bit trickier so let's let's see if we can find a way of doing this string repeating character okay um, oh string repeat nice we can repeat the string an x, x amount of times. Okay, so that's the function we're looking for. Back to the lasagna for a moment. Uh, so something like string repeat star. So nice, so there's always a function for it. And then once we have stars, can we just, can we just say do stars plus uh, new line plus uh, welcome message plus new line plus stars again. I'm very curious to see if this works. It seems to work. Okay, uh, we had some examples here where we were meant to generate strings like this one, and the test passed, so we're good to go. So takeaway is if you're working with strings and we are manipulating them, there's probably a function in the strings package for you. Definitely check that out. I'm surprised that we ended up on Geeks Four gigs for gigs rather than on any other website i have to say when you're programming within exorcism you won't get any uh, auto completion as far as i can see uh, but if you check out the exorcism executable on your own machine then it's much much easier to just install the golang uh, compiler and then maybe you're using your visual studio code or something else and you have auto completion and so on and documentation should be a lot easier to uh, browse through uh, but I wanted to check if um, we're going to be sent on onto the official documentation page. Maybe from here, okay. And if we look for repeat, then we can find the function definition, which is useful, uh, a description of the function, and then a nice example. So nice, and you can also run this and get the outputs in like in line on, on the website, which is very convenient. I'm going to keep this page open for future uh, exercises. Okay, final exercise here, final task. Um, clean up all marketing messages. So we're going to get something like this with stars, and we just want to extract um, 
the message really what's within the thing and likely we'll have to apply some more strings package ma uh, magic here to do that um, we can probably split uh, on a specific separator and then get back an array of strings as you can see and so that's the first step we're gonna take we're gonna do strings dot split old message this gen this returns an array with uh, likely three elements we just want the the, the first one um, and we want to split on the separator new line and we also want to work with arrays now so if i do arrays no how do we do that not array list no buffer maybe a buffer no what am i looking for Go line access array element. Let's see. Again, we are somewhere. Oh, just the usual square bracket access. Okay, so if I'm not mistaken, then we would extract the first element. And let's try and return that. We need to do a bit more work. <laughs> Thermidor, yes. <laughs> Two days in a row. Going strong. Uh, I'm expecting the test to fail because we have some stars um, to remove. Also, undefined string split again, capital function names, otherwise functions are not exported out of the package. Okay, and now the failure is one where we have, we were expecting by now save 10%. But we actually got, I think we actually got this one, yeah, this message here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to be removing the stars and then we can do what in, in Ruby would be a trim function, call a trim and let's see if we can do that. Back to the string package, can I trim, cut, okay, um, returns a slice of the string with all leading and trailing Unicode code points containing cut set removed. Okay, nice. Ooh, wow. So I can just say, remove these two characters, like trim from the left and right until you actually um, don't have any of these characters anymore. So if, uh, if that's the case, can we just say, then I'll, I'll, let, let me just do, message equals this and then we can do strings dot stream message and then just give it star and space let's see ah, there you go this is amazing so this is very much a great takeaway here the 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 strings package is very well thought of and very powerful um, and it only takes you a line to do an otherwise fairly complex uh, operation maybe in other languages so uh, great job uh, let's mark this as complete mark this as single iteration and go back to the syllabus and decide what we do next we've been streaming for 45 minutes so let's take a five minutes break we could do a bit of string formatting. I always dread that string FMT function, but I guess we'll have to get there uh, sooner or later. So Go provides an inbuilt, an inbuilt package called FMT, which offers a variety of functions to manipulate the format of, of input and output. The most commonly used function is sprintf, which uses verbs like percent %s, to interpolate values into a string and returns that string. Okay. All right. So FMT, sprintf, and then the usual percent %s 
uh, for string interpolation and then the variable we want to inject into the string. Easy enough. Floating point values are conveniently formatted with uh, sprintf's verbs, percent %g, compact representation, and then a few more. All three verbs allow the fields with a numeric position to be controlled. That's nice. Uh, I never learned that, but that's the same as it would be in C, I guess. So point two f would uh, indicate two decimal digits you can find a full list of, okay, and then we have a link to the format package documentation, which can just oh, open. Let's go and party with the party robot. Okay, let's see. So once there was an eccentric, eccentric programmer, I can say that. Once there was an eccentric programmer living in a strange house with barred windows, one day he accepted a job from an online job board to build a party robot. The robot is supposed to greet people and help them to their seats. Great. The first edition was very technical and showed the programmer's lack of human interaction, some of which also made it into the next edition. Okay. Step number one, implement the welcome function to return a welcome message using the given name. We know how to do this. We can use a sprintf though. Uh, that would be a good idea. So first thing, we'll import the FMT package and then we'll say something like, oh, FMT dot, what was it? FMT dot sprintf. So a sprintf will return a string whereas print and println will just print it on console. So not, not what we want here. And here we'll say, sprintf just just to try it out percent s and then name welcome to my party and then a, an exclamation mark at the end so that's much easier with the interpolation and formatting function so let's try this out sprint printf missing a t Um, missing return, fair enough. We knew this moment had to come. Return statement. Moving on. Yes, moving on. Task two, welcome a new guest to the party whose birthday is today. Mm, not much changes, but we now have also an integer number to uh, format into the string. So I'll just return like start from the previous function and then go happy birthday like this and then Frank become percent s with the name I wonder how the um, if this is just a var art sort of uh, setup where you can just list the set of uh, variables to be interpolated or if there's a different um, type required when injecting more than one value we'll figure it out in a few seconds and rather than 58 here we'll have something like percent something looking at the string sorry looking at the format package if i look for integer or number maybe uh, it's going to be called presentation format value is it v maybe then Probably want to go back to uh, base two, base ten, D. So let's go for D. Percent D should do should do the job. Uh, percent D. Run tests. Did you go through? Uh, with an age. Okay. Uh, Happy birthday, S. You are now here years old. What did we get instead? Fail. Uh, you are now 61. Oh, oh, sorry. I forgot to actually use the variable age. 
We should be good now. Moving on. Task number three. Give directions. Okay. Implement the assign table function to give directions. Okay. It should accept five parameters. Name of the guest. Table number. Name of the seat mate. Direction where to find the table. Distance to the table. Okay. There's a bit of everything. Uh, the message should be on three lines. Wow. Okay, I don't know what the um, convention here is here, but we can probably do something like line one, column equal, and then concatenate each one. I don't know. Or line two, column equal, and then line three, column equal. You will be sitting next to Frank, okay, so do something like so. This is fmt dot sprintf. Now, no one can say we don't know how to use sprintf because we've done enough exercise percent s and then the neighbor. And for the second one, second line says, you know, I've been assigned to table x, okay. Exactly, so these are all numbers. Let's see, you know, I've been assigned to table percent %d with three digits, we'll have to figure that out, and then percent, I guess percent dot one or two, one f, I always feel uh, so, um, Sad when I have to write this stuff, but fine, S print F it is. Um, and then first line is actually welcome to my party, Christian. Uh, and I think we can reuse the function we defined earlier. So maybe we can do welcome, welcome name. Are we actually doing table as well? So welcome name, that's fine. Then we have table, oh, on the left. Okay, so this is a percent S. And then we're passing in, in the right order, we're passing in the table number. Table, direction, and distance. Um, I wonder how we do base 10 but with a leading zero or like three digits maybe an example please <laughs> yep here we go with nine okay so we can just say with three on d <laughs> uh with i guess if we do three d oh and then of course we need to return something yeah return uh, line one plus line two plus line three and make sure that we have a new line at the end of each this bit I'll just say we have the central line going on new line for everyone and then we probably forgot some parentheses uh, this should not close here an extra parenthesis actually this is fine okay what are we getting uh, what are we getting Getting welcome to my party, key hero. Nine two meters. Oh zero two. Okay. The width of the integer is not right. So going back to FMT here, we want maybe with nine default precision. Maybe padding with spaces. 
zero for octal. I'm trying to figure out how to format it, format an integer with a leading zero. Percent, uh, no examples, okay. Go along, format int with leading zero. Okay, someone's listening to us. Uh, oh gosh, what is this? Hmm. Percent zero and then the number of characters. Yes, so we're just missing what should be the padding character. So if we just say, we just we already said that we want a width of three and if we give it the zero, then it's gonna be using zero for padding or not. Okay, let's see how far we are. Uh, zero 22, yeah, so far so good. Uh, exactly, exactly. Your table is on the straight, is on the, oh, okay on the left or straight and so on um so on the left is actually the direction uh, and i just use the string as it was but actually is probably need to suppress on the ah oh, there you go submitting marking as complete sharing the single iteration I'm moving on to what I think should be the last exercise of the day. We're going to go into a few things are blocked, so we'll have to go back to booleans. Not super exciting, but actually they might be fun in Golang. So let's see. Or lowercase or double percent. Not. Yeah, seems easy enough. Let's dive straight into it. Um, Quest logic for a new RPG game. Okay, so there's gonna be a few conditions to be checked against each other to figure out whether someone is dying or winning or whatever. For example, can fast attack, knight is awake. Let's see the condition for this. Um, this function turns true, true if a fast attack can be made based on the state of the knight, otherwise returns false. So if the knight is awake, we're gonna exit, we are gonna return false. Otherwise we're gonna return true. So this is maybe just a case of returning not knight is awake. Let's see. Yes, it is, okay, moving on. Uh, check if the group can be spied upon takes three boolean values it pretends true if the group can be spied upon based on the state of the three characters okay uh, for example maybe we can have some more information the group can be spied upon if at least one of them is awake otherwise spying is a waste of time okay so an or operator is what we look we want here so if any of these uh, is awake then we return true so we're gonna do return this or this or this and then move on. Great. And then number three, check if the prisoner can be signaled. The function turns true if the prisoner can be signaled based on the state of the two characters, otherwise it returns false. And if we go up, we can get an explanation of what that means. Prisoner can be signaled using bird sounds if the prisoner is awake and the archer is sleeping, as archers are trained in bird signaling, as you all well know, so they could intercept the message. Okay, so we want the prisoner to be awake and the archer to be sleeping. So archer is awake must be true. And at the same time, prisoner is awake must be false so an end not prisoner is awake is what we're looking for i'm just going to return run the test okay i think 
Das can see now. Let's see. Oh, sorry, other way around, right? So it's this. Let's do this. Not Archer is awake and Prisoner is awake. Okay. Next one. Check if Prisoner can be freed. Um, four Boolean values. First three indicate if the knight, archer, and prisoner respectively are awake. The last parameter indicates if Annalyn's pet dog is present. The function turns true if the prisoner can be freed based on the state of the three characters and the pet. Okay, let's see what that is about. Um, if the pet, if Annalyn has her pet dog with her, she can rescue the prisoner, so that has to be if the archer is asleep, the knight is scared of the of the dog, and the archer will not have time to get ready before Annalyn and the prisoner can escape. Uh, if Annalyn does not have her dog, then she she and the prisoner must be very sneaky. Annalyn can free the prisoner prisoner if the prisoner is awake and the knight and the archer are both asleep. But if the prisoner is sleeping, they can't be rescued. The prisoner would be startled by Annalyn's sudden appearance and wake up the knight and archer. Okay, fair enough, this all makes perfect sense. Um, so if the dog is there, she can rescue the prisoner if the archer is asleep. The knight is scared of the dog, and the archer will not have time to get ready. Okay, okay. So it doesn't matter if the knight is asleep or not, as far as I understand. Um, so let's try this. With the dog, the scenario where the dog is, is around, uh, then we're gonna do with dog, we're gonna do pet, dog is present. And uh, the archer is asleep. If the archer is asleep. And we don't know anything about the prisoner, so we'll, let's just say um, the prisoner status doesn't matter. So it's not. Archer is awake. Something like this. And then without dog this is a bit more complicated there's not ever dog okay so not not pet dog is present and mm, free the prisoner if the prisoner is awake so prisoner awake okay and then what else uh, and the knight and the archer are both sleeping and not archer is awake and not pre not prisoner but uh, knight is awake something like this but then there's another condition but if the prisoner is sleeping, they can't be rescued. Okay, let's try this. Let's see how far off the mark we are. With dog or without dog. I'd be surprised if this is a green, but it is. <laughs> okay, so I don't feel very clever right now, but Sometimes that's what Boolean do, do to you. Uh, so we can submit this solution, mark this as complete, share it with the word, our amazing work. Go back to concept, see what has been unlocked for us. We have comparison and conditional ifs. Okay, this might get us to write some more exciting code. But for all the purposes of today, 
if I go back to not reputation overview whatever just want to go back to my dashboard and I go to the 12 in 23 challenge which we care about go is now also a language that we have completed so off we go um, I'll stop streaming now thank you very much for watching I hope you enjoyed some of this at least um, I know it's a bit mellow but maybe you can use this and the sound of my mechanical keyboard to fall asleep I won't be offended and uh, yeah thanks for um, exploring go with us um, let's see if we can pick up rust next time i think it would be nice to do five exercises in rust and then maybe play a bit with the concurrency uh, primitives in rust outside of the exorcism um, <laughs> exorcism ecosystem thermidor no stop streaming smooth italian man mellow talking yes that's that's a great definition <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Thermidor. Hopefully you'll uh, catch up uh, again very, very soon. Maybe even tomorrow. Who knows? Uh, yeah, Rust on the list. So get ready for some Rust. And otherwise, I'll see you very, very soon. Thanks for watching again.